Uh, okay, everyone. <clears throat> What's up? Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over the big 15-game main that we have here on uh, June 27, Tuesday. A um, lot of arms, right? A lot of arms, a lot of games. I think this is actually, this might be the first full 15-game slate that we've had this year. Um, so naturally, in baseball, high-variance sport, we can get to pretty much anything we want. Um, you know, there's obvious spots you want to avoid. I would not suggest playing Connor Siebold against the Dodgers at Coors Field tonight, for example. Um, but in terms of ownership and exploitable spots, for the most part on these huge slates like this, we can feel pretty confident in just running projections, right? Um, yeah, you want to go through a lot of, of fundamental stuff to try and split hairs if you need to. Um, but in a lot of scenarios, we don't really need to, right? There's so much value and so many playable spots that you can make some pivots and you really, due to the variance, right? Certainly on the mound, but mostly in the, in the batter's box, due to the variance, you're not sacrificing all that much equity uh, when you pivot from one cheap guy to another cheap guy necessarily, right? Um, you still got to do the, your proper analysis and price analysis and, and ownership analysis and all that kind of stuff. Um, but on full slates like this, for the most part, you can run projections, right? Run good numbers like we have here in the, in the aggregates and feel pretty confident that you're going to be mostly on the right track. Um, and, and that's kind of how we need to approach really, really large slates like this. Um, so let's, uh, let's just get into it. We do have projections and ownership already loaded to the site. Keep an eye out for, like, this is a show. Hey day. We talked about this all season. Um, anyway, we've got some ownership shenanigans coming through on him so far so this 14 percent will not persist uh throughout the day um so just keep an eye out for updates we'll we'll be pushing them you know as as often as possible you know we have a, a several updates all throughout the day um so you can keep an eye out as to how those things will change um and see how the market you know, adjust to things all throughout the day. So let's just get into it. Reds and the Orioles here in Baltimore in game two of their series. Uh, this was the game you needed last night, and you needed Baltimore. Um, and, and you know, Strider, of course, maybe, you know, one of the guys from the, uh, the Angels game. Um, but offensively, you needed the Orioles. I think you probably consider going right back to them tonight. Um now, Andrew Abbott, he's got four starts here for the Reds. He's been pretty damn good, to be quite honest. He finally gave up some production in his last start um, and gave up three, I believe. Yeah, it was three against Colorado. Gave up two, at least two solo homers. I think it was Leas Diaz and uh, Zeke Tovar, maybe. Um, could have been a third solo homer in any case finally starting to give up a little bit of production but his first four starts have been fantastic right milwaukee and colorado some pretty good matchups there in terms of you know suppression and pretty poor offenses right a little bit more difficult in the matchups against st louis and houston but he was very good there too struck out 10 in his last outing against colorado and struck out six against milwaukee right those are good matchups for left-handers harder matchups for Houston and St. Louis, and naturally the strikeout stuff was lower, but he still went deep in those games, right? And all four, Milwaukee, St. Louis, Houston, and Colorado, has gone six, five and two-thirds, six, and six innings, right? So a little bit of depth here so far is pretty encouraging for Abbott. Um, decent four-pitch mix, and he's really going to work with it. Good balance here, certainly in the secondary arsenals, not getting too heavy on, on one pitch, um, so he trusts all four of them, and that's really encouraging for a young arm. Now, this is not necessarily the matchup and certainly not the price tag that I want to be going after uh, the Orioles with. Um, 8600 I think, is probably a bit aggressive now. He is in play because he's been great, and he's got a really good four-pitch mix here so far. However, 
Um, you know, we talked about this in his last start. We're looking for some regression, right? He's not going to have 100% strand rate his entire career. Um, you know, despite good early count stuff, 62% strike one, got a little bit of chase, 27% here. We need some more swinging strikes out of him if we're going to be super confident in paying this type of price tag in bad matchups. And the Orioles against lefties are, you know, they're a pretty strong team against lefties, right? We talked about this yesterday. 112 WRC plus 21% K rate, high walk rate, mostly buoyed by Adley Rushman up at the top. But some of these other guys will walk also. We'll have to see what they want to do with the lineup tonight. Gunner got a day off yesterday since they wanted to give Westberg a little bit of run. Um, we'll see what they want to do. It'll likely be... You know, they may give Cedric a day off. Uh, they He was in the five or the six hole yesterday or something like that. So they're, they're pulling all kinds of shenanigans over here. Um, really trying to platoon and stay equitable. And they do that pretty well for the most part and play their good matchups. Austin Hayes likely going to lead off again. He's been pretty decent against left-handed pitching this year. He's at a playable 3,500. Rutch at 52. He's down a little bit price-wise. And his right side, certainly not the strong his stronger stride, but playable, definitely. Um, and should get some ABs from the left side, assuming you know full Baltimore stacks would work. Right, He could get two, three ABs, um, even against... Uh, a right-hander coming out of the bullpen, for example. Anthony Santander got a price drop as well. He's down to 42. Really like him from the right side for sure. And you can get to any of the cheaper pieces down at the bottom of the lineup as filler stacks. I'd probably prefer just short stacks. Um, but this team is very dangerous against right and left-handed pitching. We saw that last night. Now, they got mostly a bullpen game, you know, for all intents and purposes last night. But still very attackable. Um, going against uh, left-handed pitching. So at these price tags, I, I like playing and going right back to some Baltimore if we can make it happen. Still looking for a little bit more regression for Andrew Abbott You know, to the downside. I think his price tag is a little bit too high for me to jump on board him tonight. Tyler Wells on the other side, he's going to see a good bit of ownership. Um, you know, if you do want to pivot off of some of this Wells, uh, you play Abbott. You know, it's not bad. Um, certainly not a plus matchup, of course, and and Tyler Wells here is a better, more established arm, definitely. He's got a better arsenal, right? Full five pitches here, and all of them getting value above the field. Pretty damn spread out, really equitable here for Tyler Wells. Problem with him is he's got a huge barrel rate. Like, he gives up a lot of loud contact to the right side. It's not necessarily an average, right? Just 188 to the left, he's 183, batting average allowed to the righty so far this year. Wobos are really strong, as are the expected metrics in those two categories as well. However, he will get on to the barrel a little bit. 174 ISO to the lefties, 240 ISO to the righties with a 211 aggregate X ISO. 37% hard to the right side with a good bit of fly balls here. 060 ground ball to fly ball. Now, he's not so much on a line here, which makes it a little less attractive to be going after him um but we really can't ignore 37 percent hard contact to righties and a 55 percent fly ball rate uh it's a lot of contact a lot of loud contact in the air and it translates to a 240 iso and the 2.2 homers per nine to the right side a full five and a half percent raw home run rate here He's a stone lock to give up a dinger every single outing. He's given up 18 homers this year in 15 appearances. So we're a little on the fence here, I think, um, with the Tyler Wells. Now, I do really like the strikeout stuff, certainly to the left side. A couple of these lefties over here from the Reds, in particular, Ellie De La Cruz, he's going to strike out a lot, um, even though the left side is far and away his better side. Fraley will strike out a little bit, and Joey Votto the last couple of seasons has been striking out a good bit as well. Um, will Benson, sure, he's still a, a pretty young-ish hitter, and he'll strike out a little bit also. Now to the right side, Matt McClain's going to strike out some. Johnny India, not so much, uh, but Spencer Steer will strike out a little from the right side. So the, over here, the, the Reds, while very dangerous, and these numbers are going to continue to tick upward, against righties now that they've got both Ellie and um, and Joey Votto. Ellie is up and Joey Votto is back. Jake Fraley's healthy again. 
right? They can go pretty balanced. They can have five lefties in the lineup here tonight if they if they choose with TJ Friedel and Will Benson as well. So they could be pretty balanced. They're still going to walk a lot. This number is probably going to tick up because of Joey Votto, right? Power numbers, if Votto can continue to you know, stay healthy and hit as well as he has. Let's not forget, a couple seasons ago, he's only, a, what, two, three seasons removed from damn near winning a second MVP. Um, guy can still hit. So, you know, at these price tags for the Reds, do we really want to be going after a guy with, you know, well above average arm? Sure, he'll give up a little bit of pop, but he's got swing and miss, and he doesn't really walk people. It's the questionable barrel rate here that does put some of these Reds in play, but at their particular price tags, I'm not super interested, to be quite honest. TJ Friedel is more of a cash play up at the top, 4,400. He's fine, I suppose. He's leading off. He's going to get a lot of ABs, of course. Matt McClain, 49. He's going to strike out a ton. Not, no thanks. Johnny India, 48. Also not super thrilled about that. Not a lot of power from him. Ellie at 58. Like I said, he's going to strike out. And this is Ellie. You could play him. Um, but 5,800 is no bargain. Jake Fraley, 5,000. Joey Votto, 51. And Spencer Steer, 48. So these guys are not cheap. I have to side with Tyler Wells in that respect. Um, I think... At 15% owner, I'm okay with this number. I think you could probably come in under this. Uh, this just because this is a 15-game slate, you can play so many different arms here. But I have no problem getting to Tyler Wells here tonight. Um, there's some hidden strikeouts in the, in this lineup, even though it is very dangerous. I'd mostly side with Wells. I prefer his price tag to all the price tags of the Reds, for example. Um, but you know, I would not be surprised if uh, a little bloop and a blast comes to haunt Tyler Wells here. He does give up power, so... Keep that in mind if you're clicking in a lot of Tyler Wells here tonight. Um, once again, have to prefer the Orioles stack-wise going after a younger and less established arm. And some Tyler Wells correlated pieces. I think those are fine constructions. Um, some one-offs of Ellie where it, where it works. I think that's fine. He's got a lot of upside, man. Even at this price, most of it's priced in. But, uh, you know, it's still a fine tournament play. He's not, he's not going to be played at this price tag tonight. Um and, and some Votto, maybe from the left side, you know, from the right side. Oof. Uh, probably just going to stay off of most of the righties, I think. Um, even though the depressed strikeout rate from Tyler Wells and the higher power numbers and contact allowed, I think their strikeout numbers, the Reds, McLean, and Spencer Steer in particular, from the right side. Tyler Stevenson, not a lot of power there necessarily. Um I think that plays into a little bit more Tyler Wells' favor than the Reds. So that's kind of where I stand on that game. Let's uh, let's move on since we got so many to get through. San Diego and Pittsburgh, you Darvish on the mound. He's also going to see a little bit of ownership here at 8,100. I like this price tag, and I like this matchup a little bit. Um, nice projection and good value score so far here. We're looking for a little bit of positive regression for Darvish, I think. He's got a 485 ERA here with expected metrics, about a run lower Good whip still at a buck twenty-five. Walk rate still average, you know, seven and a half percent for Darvish. That's fine. He's still having a little bit of trouble throwing strike one, strike one that is. That's because he's throwing forty-two different pitches here, right? All seven that he's actually using at a respectable clip, right? Not a lot of the changeup, of course, but he's throwing seven pitches. I mean, there's only so many pitches in in a, you know, you got ninety-five here, and when you're throwing thirty-seven percent of your slider. Um, you know, how often are you really going to be able to get to all the other six pitches? In any case, super low strand rate here, 66% for Darvish. Um, he's been a little bit attackable to right-handers. I think he's running a little bit bad, though, to be quite honest. If we just take some kind of crude averages here uh, of the batting average, it's about 244, 245 right here, right? I guess the aggregate total um, is 242 allowed. He's got an XBA of 233, so running about you know a tick, tick and a half cold there. Same thing with the Woba, running about a tick, tick and a half cold. Um, and certainly in the ISO as well, if we're just raw averaging these, that's 170, 175 or so. He's got a 141 X ISO. 21% strikeout rate to the right-handers with more hard contact and more fly balls, making him a little bit more attackable with righties giving up the 1.9 homers per nine so far. But like I said, we're looking for a little bit of positive regression for Darvish. And on a 15-game slate, I 
I mean, if this were an eight-game slate, he'd be twice or even three times this popular. So um, I think we're probably getting a little bit of value in that respect, and I've got no problems playing some Darvish here against Pirates. They're missing their best hitter, Brian Reynolds. Um, so they've been having to kind of screw around at the top of the lineup. You place a couple of Pirates pieces where they're well-priced. I think Jiwon Bay is fine at the top. He doesn't really need to hit for a lot of power. It's a good thing because Darvish's not going to give that up necessarily to the lefties. Uh, but he's got enough speed that, you know, a, a single, he could steal two bases uh, really without issue here uh, against Darvish. Throwing so much junk, he's going to have a lot of opportunity to pick some good pitches to steal on, given all the off-speed stuff that, that Darvish screws around with. Um, so that's a fine play, 2,500, dual eligibility, second base in the outfield. Kutch is fine at 42 as well, since the numbers are what the numbers are. And he's still giving up a 215 ISO with a 35% hard contact and a neutral ground ball to fly ball to the right side. So Kutch is fine. Josh Palacios, they'll probably have him replacing Brian Reynolds up at the top at 2,000. I mean, he's 2,000. Sure, go ahead. And lower strikeout arms from the left side, I think I'd prefer like a, a Carlos Santana. Jack Sawinski, not one of them. He does still make good, solid contact, so he's in play, definitely. Um, Cabrian Hayes is okay, 3,700. Not wild about the price in this matchup, necessarily. But he does hit a lot of ground balls, and batted ball-wise, he still g makes a good bit of hard contact. And against a neutral ground ball to fly ball, Split for Darvish here. That plays okay for Cabrian Hayes. So I think some, you know, both sides are in play. I got to side with Darvish, of course. Um, but I think a little bit of the Pirates in deep tournament stacks don't need to get there in 20 max or anything. Deep tournament stuff, I think it, some of the Pirates as cheap filler pieces, they're totally off the board. Nobody's going to be playing them. Uh, but they're popping a little bit in value, and that's because of their cheap price tags. This is a sneaky okay spot for them at least for a couple of these righties like Kutch and Cabrian Hayes. Um, I think they're in play a little bit. Certainly not a favorite stack by any means. I just got to side with Darvish, definitely. Rich Hill on the on the mound for the Pirates, 6,300. Just going to leave him on the shelf here today, I think. Uh, this is a really bad matchup against the Padres. Recently against lefties, they've been fantastic. And the number's starting to really tick up. 115 WRC plus against lefties this year. 10% walk rate nearly with a 22% strikeout rate. 253 average allowed. It's not going to wow us or anything, but uh, starting to tick up, as I mentioned, 196 ISO. Then now we're starting to get into uh, pretty attractive territory for the Padres, 31.5% hard or so with a, a neutral ground ball to fly ball. So with Soto having gotten going, that walk rate is going to continue to tick up, right? Um, and certainly against lefties, he's, he's very patient. And all of these right-handers, I mean, especially if Hassan Kim at the top of the lineup is going to be hitting the baseball over the wall like he has over the last week, it's going to make them far more difficult to get through uh, than they were in the early part of the season when they were very attackable with righties and lefties, really, to be honest. Uh, Hassan Kim at 43, second base, are probably going to lead him off again, and it's a pretty decent matchup against Rich Hill. Still giving up some pop, even though he's been pretty serviceable most of the season, still giving up a little bit of pop to the righties, right? 253 average there, 338 Woba with a 213 ISO allowed. And aggregate has a 206 X ISO, 278 XBA. It's kind of a big number. And a 358 X Woba. So probably going to see a little bit of negative regression coming to Rich Hill here um, in terms of the batted ball metrics and, and raw contact and perhaps even a little bit in the run suppression. ERA and the XFIP mostly in line with where they... Um, really kind of should be, or at least the ERA with the XFIP. XERA about a run, run and a half higher, though. So got to keep an eye, uh, an eye out for that a little bit with Rich Hill. 6,300 normally would kind of put Rich Hill in play, but I don't think we're going to need to get all the way down here. Um, if you land on this in deep tournament stuff, I don't think it's all that horrific. But I'm certainly not going to go out of my way to do this. Uh, he has 20 points, but he, I think he's probably capped at about 20 points here tonight. It's a really bad strikeout matchup. And he's just an average, well, you know, two ticks below average strikeout guy to really both sides of the plate. Having a little bit of trouble still getting ahead in counts and throwing strike one. And his last couple of starts have, you know, the, those problems have started to rear their head a little bit. Um, so... Not super interested in, in playing any Rich Hill tonight. Rather get to some of the Padres, but my goodness, 65 for Tati, 62 for Soto, 59 now for Manny Machado, and 54 for Bogarts. Um, 
you know, Hassan Kim and Gary Sanchez going to make it a little bit cheaper, as will Anelli Cruz from the right side of the plate. Don't really want to play lefties outside of Soto necessarily, so probably no Jay Cronenworth here for me tonight. But, I mean, they're going to be totally off the board. Nobody's going to play them because there's a very expensive team in a far, far better spot um, that's going to garner all the ownership. So that makes the Padres, that puts them in play in tournaments. But uh, at these price tags, they're kind of priced out from a lot of the upside that they generally offer. I mean, Manny Machado at 59, he's a good hitter, but is he a $6,000 hitter? I don't know. I don't know. Um, so price adjusted, I think my favorites here, just got to be Hassan Kim at second base in the mid-range. I think that's a pretty decent play. Gary Sanchez, Nelly Cruz in that order, I think. Um, and then, of course, you can always play Tatis, and you can certainly play Manny and Bogarts. Of the expensive guys, Bogarts has to be the best or the favorite price adjusted play at 5400. That's a fine price tag for him. So there everybody pretty much in play here I think outside of Rich Hill. Uh, okay, let's move on to San Francisco and Toronto. I've got Alex Wood here in the sheet for the Giants. Um, they're going to have Ryan Walker open again and we talked about this all the time when the Giants run a bullpen game. We have no damn idea what they're going to do. Um, who they're going to bring in immediately after. Now, Alex Wood has been mostly you know the the second guy coming out of the bullpen or the first guy coming out of the bullpen, I should say, as opposed to like a Sean Manaya, who is sometimes the second guy coming out of the bullpen. Um, in any case, it's likely going to be him. He's at 6,100. I don't think we could play him, certainly not against Toronto. He's been dreadful, really, all season. Um, definitely against right. He's 278 average allowed, 376 Wobo with a 209 ISO. The expected metrics not suggesting that those numbers should really be any different. 248 XBA, maybe a little... You know, a little bit better there. 355x Woba, it's kind of elevated, but a 205x ISO too. Just a 20, 21 and a half percent K rate. It's a little bit higher to the to the righties. Um, you know, and we got a short sample here against the lefties. He's always been usually, he's usually been pretty good, I should say, uh, against left-handers, um, and always had you know respectable strikeout numbers there. So this 12 percent K rate to the left side so far this season, you know, quite noisy and just a 40 hitter sample or whatever. So we can kind of ignore that. It's the righty numbers here that are a little bit concerning for Alex Wood. 23% K rate there, that's fine. But he's got a 10% walk rate to the righties and a 15% walk rate so far in the short sample to the lefties. So he's putting guys on base here and having a little bit of trouble getting ahead in counts. He still just throws the two-seamer and focuses on that. And that is always going to – this is only fastball. That's always going to yield a lot of production – two opposite-handed hitters. It's not a strikeout pitch unless you can get it down, way down in the strike zone uh, to, to opposite-handers, then you're going to have problems. And he really can't do that. Just a neutral ground ball to fly ball here against the right side. Um, do you want to play some of the, the Blue Jays? Yeah, I think they're very much in play. Though they're kind of expensive as well. 56 for Springer, 57 for Bichette. Uh, Brandon Belt, he's not expensive against his old team. Uh, he'll probably be in there because, as I mentioned, they do get a right-hander Ryan Walker uh, opening for them. Uh, Vladdy's 56, Chapman's 51. So not easy to make full Blue Jay stacks happen. You're going to have to go into the mid-range, not going to be able to get up to like a Kevin Gosman on the mound necessarily at 11,000. So um, you got to keep an eye out for what the Giants do. Of course, this is a bullpen game, technically. They may very well let Ryan Walker run for two innings here, get through all of the righties up at the top of the lineup, and then bring in Alex Wood, who is historically better against lefties when they've got their low upside lefties down at the bottom of the lineup, like Dalton Varsho, Kevin Kiermeyer, see what they do with uh, Kevin Biggio, something like that. And all of a sudden, you're now through three innings. You know, if all if things go well through the Giants, you're now through three innings here and a full time through the lineup, and you basically totally neutered the, uh, you know, all of the upside and, and one full at bat for each one of these guys from the Jays. So that said, in DFS, that would kind of take me off of full Blue Jays stacks because I. Even though the Giants, I don't really like all this platoon garbage that they play with their starting pitchers, it works. And that makes it difficult for opposing offenses. When you're seeing a different arm every single at bat, it's hard to get into um, a rhythm. So it, it works. And you know, at least over the last you know three weeks, two weeks, 
Giants have been winning some baseball games, and this has been working for them. Their offense has been a little bit better. They've had good matchups, yes. Uh, but their pitching staff it, and playing all of those platoon matchups, that's really how they've been winning baseball games. So that would take me off of Toronto a little bit here. Um, and they're seeing resistance at the five run total mark in the betting market. So keep that in mind if you're building a bunch of Toronto teams. That said, Alex Wood's still attackable with all these righties. And historically, the right-handers from Toronto have hit lefties pretty well. This season, they're much better against righties. Just a 130 ISO for the the Jays against lefties. And that's not all that attractive. 30% hard contact, a lot of ground balls. And they pop some balls up here. So kind of a low upside offense, even though they don't strike out a lot. So not super thrilled about getting to the Jays. The combination of their bad numbers and the bullpen shenanigans and their price tags kind of take me off. I'd certainly rather just play some other teams. Uh, but it makes them a decent tournament stack. They're attainable price-wise, and you can make it happen. But it's not going to be with Gosman on the mound, necessarily. 11000 for him. Like The only thing that's going to pre- prevent us from getting to a lot of Gosman here today is that it's a 15-game slate. We could play 62 different arms. And he's 11 Um you know, yesterday with Spencer Strider at 12-6, even on a six-game slate, there was that's much easier to stomach. But on a 15-gamer, you know, we got so many arms that, you know, we don't necessarily have to get all the way up to this. And on full slates like this, I really don't like doing it generally. Um, I think you take a lot of risk with a super expensive arm. There's just cheaper guys that have similar upside and at 20% ownership, I don't think this is necessary to totally get to. Um, I think I prefer on, on very large slates like this, staying in the mid-range with some totally unknown pitchers, and then you can play really good projections for your hitters and go after some really popular spots, like Coors Field tonight, uh, for example. But that doesn't mean that he's not in play, because he's still got really damn good numbers. The only question mark here really is the barrel rate at 10% for Gosman and the hard contact to the right side. Now, he's giving it up to the left side here a little bit as well. That's pretty worrisome with a neutral ground ball to fly ball rate. 37% hard contact to left-handers is concerning. 38.5% to right-handers. He's got a bit higher ground ball rate there. Uh, So that's not as bad necessarily. And he's still got a hell of a lot of chase, 34%. But this is down six and seven ticks from where it was last year. Not getting as much chase, even though the strikeout stuff is still very high this season for Gosman. Not getting as much chase. So at the same price tag up here, like he's kind of struggled in a couple of outings when he's been priced this high. So that should be a pretty, uh, pretty big flashing sign for us to be like, hey, a lot of the upside is kind of priced out when we have to pay this kind of price tag for a guy. So um, that kind of takes me off of a little bit of the Jays and a little bit of Gosman. Not to say they're bad plays necessarily because this is a decent matchup and the Giants do still strike out a lot. But they're a dangerous offense here. 175 ISO, 34% hard, and fly ball. So uh, they're going to walk. And if, I mean, Gosman's not going to walk a lot of guys, but he starts spiking this splitter. It's very reasonable that Gosman could put up a stinker, and he's done that in a couple of his last starts. You know, three starts ago, he got blown up by Minnesota, gave up six runs, gave up four in the first inning. Um, So that's not really super attractive to me, you know, going after a very high upside tournament stack in the Giants. If you want to play some Giants, I don't think they're totally off the board. So, you know, price-wise, it's not... All that thrilling, like playing a Jock Peterson at 5,000 or a Tyro at 56. But Michael Conforto still at a very playable 4,000. Blake Sable, 38. You know, Lamont Wade, 41. It's okay if you get to them, but it's deep tournament stuff only because I really don't like going after Gosman because he's got such high K stuff. So um, that's kind of where I stand on that. Mostly just Toronto and and some Gosman here. No Alex Wood, definitely. Maybe a couple of Giants pieces, but... Um, Oh, eh, kind of lukewarm on the game for the most part. All right, let's move on. Milwaukee and the Mets. Julio teron has been pretty good. 7,400 on the mound. This is a tough matchup. I think Julio is probably due for a a stinker sometime soon, right? He's got an 088 whip here, not sustainable at this point in his career. 90% strand rate, not sustainable ever. Um, certainly not with a, a 17.5% K rate and just a 22.5% 
chase rate. Now, he's been very efficient early in the count, 67% strike one, and he's using five pitches here. Historically, he's been heavy sinker slider, moved a lot of the slider usage from earlier in his career over to the cutter now. He's thrown some four-seamer now, too. I wish he'd just not do this. But he's pretty balanced, and that's kept him equitable so far. Now, he's had a couple of good matchups, right? San Francisco in his in his first outing was pretty decent, went five innings, struck out five. Um, had Cincinnati before they called up Ellie, for example, had Oakland, had Pittsburgh, right? And he survived in these outings. Toronto, he survived as well, went full six innings there, didn't strike out anybody, you know, but didn't give up any production. So um, I think he's running probably a little bit hot here. As of right now, the contact numbers look fine for the most part, getting some decent ground balls to the right side. Historically, he's always been more susceptible to left-handers, but later in his career, before he introduced this cutter, of course, he had actually kind of uh, flipped the, the platoon disadvantage, so to speak, and he was giving up a little bit more production to right-handers. Now, he's got to be careful if he throws this cutter too much to the right-handers. Um, now that it's a good pitch for him, he's got to stay mostly with lefties. This is not a same-handed pitch because it gets over the barrel a little bit. So he's got to go two-seamer slider to the righties and stay cutter change to lefties, and that's a pretty good equitable mix for him. But that said, it is only two pitches to either side of the plate. So I think we're due to see a little bit of Julio Tehran regression here. Um, now, are the Mets the type of are, are the Mets the type of lineup that can really take advantage of that uh, of some regression? I mean, maybe, but overall they're a really poor offense. I mean, they even could couldn't get it going against uh, Colin Ray yes yesterday, uh, for example. So. Um, Uh, sorry, got a little bit distracted here on the side. Um, they couldn't get it, it go, going here um, uh, against a, a really attackable arm yesterday. So despite Julio having some negative regression coming to him in the tank, um, yeah, am I thrilled about playing a lot of the Mets? Not really. The, the offense just sucks. You know, they're really not all, impress all that impressive against righties or lefties. They don't create. They don't steal bases. They don't hit the baseball over the wall. They're just an average team, and they've underperformed really all season. So um, not all that thrilled about playing them, really, to be honest. I do like Brandon Nimmo, 4000 price adjusted. I think this is fine. Frankie Lindo at 4800 and and Pete Alonzo, price-wise, are not, you know, super thrilling. I'm always okay playing PD though at 52. That I think that's fine. Everybody else though just kind of stinks, and that kind of takes me off of them a little bit. So, um, not thrilling to be playing full Met stacks against Julio here. I don't really think he's in play necessarily because I have upside concerns on a 15 game. You're going to need 30 out of your starting pitchers here tonight, I think. So not jacked about playing him, but also not super thrilled about stacking against him, even though I am kind of looking for some regression. It would be like short stacks, Nimmo, Lindor, P.D. Alonzo, something like that. Um, that would be the most attractive, I think. David Peterson going for the Mets on the mound. They just brought him back up since they optioned Tyler McGill. They had to option David Peterson because he was dreadful at the early part of the season. He's got an ERA of eight and a full eight starts. Um now, he's got an XFIP of three and a half. So let's, if we're talking about regression, probably going to see it in the opposite direction for David Peterson. However, he's got to stay off of the barrel, man. Like, the raw barrel rate is only at 10%. But I could tell you that he was giving up way more loud contact than this at the beginning of the season. And a lot of it was to the left side. He could not get a lefty out to save his life. He was better against the righties, but he was still giving up a 180 ISO there, too. So the numbers overall, not good for David Peterson. Hopefully he's kind of figured it out down in the minors here a little bit, but I'm not I'm not dealing with this. Uh, he's going to see some ownership because this is a left-hander against the Brewers who are dreadful. 28% um, K rate still, no power still, 34% hard. Uh, yeah, okay, whatever, but it's all on the ground. Buck 40 ground ball to fly ball. 79 WRC plus, no thanks. Um so an elevated ownership for an arm that I've, I've got serious concerns is any good at all. He's got some strikeout stuff in him, yeah, at 26% or whatever, and that would put him in play. But he 
is also, you know, we'll get to another arm later in this, you know, 6K range. He's going to be popular. And what this is going to mean is, you know, he'll be popular in Dodgers teams. And all the Dodgers are going to be popular as well. So you're getting a little bit chalky here if you start eating, you know, cheap pitchers and, and decent ownership on them because, you know, a lot of similar builds are going to be with Dodgers teams. So just something to keep in mind there. Um, I, I'd prefer to mostly stay off of David Peters because I think he's dreadful. So I'm likely to just ignore this. He's going to have to show me that, um, you know, even in a, a pretty good matchup, he's not going to give up power to this rate. Um, you know, he's got a 207 XI, so I don't really want to deal with any of this at uh, elevated ownership on a 15 gamer. I think I'd rather pivot to some other guys, I think. Um, you know, he shouldn't be this bad to all of these guys. And like I said, he's got an ERA of eight with an XFIP down at three and a half, 60% strand rate. So probably see a good bit of a bounce for him. And this is the matchup to do that in. Uh, but I'm personally not interested. I'd rather just uh, kind of let it go. Um, I do think the price tag is okay. And 6,600, yeah, I mean, it, it puts him in play against the Brewers since they're terrible. But I would almost like to play some of Milwaukee on the other side. 36 for Owen Miller I like. Willie Contreras, really good numbers against lefties. 43 for him. Willie Adamas, 43 for him. You you, you could even play a Christian Yelich here, 46. Not super thrilled about so many ground balls because um, David Peterson still does have a high ground ball rate. But I want to get to some of these righties, I think, and, and any of the guys down at the bottom of the lineup, they'll make it cheap enough for you. I think they're an intriguing stack. I'm still looking for Milwaukee to continue to bounce to the upside and produce a little bit more against left-handed pitching. Okay, Miami and Boston, let's move on. Sandy Alcantara, I just can't do it, man. Like, I love Sandy, and I'm really looking for him to be better. But, like, he's got three starts this season over 20 DK points. Three. And... It's not like he's been hurt or anything like that. He just has, he's been bad every single start. And he really shouldn't be, right? He's got a 60% strand rate. Like, whenever anybody gets on base, he's pitching to so much contact here compared to, like, last year. Right, 250, 260 XBA here is is a pretty respectable figure, um, you know, for opposing offenses. And the strikeout stuff is just totally gone for Sandy. 19% strikeout rate this year is down five ticks. From last year, velocity is still there, but the value on the changeup is totally gone. He can't not get a lefty out to save his life, giving up a good bit of hard contact here, 36%. Now, with we talked about this a couple of times with runners, uh, with nobody on base, right? With the bases empty, Sandy's actually been pretty respectable. It's when runners get on, he's got to be tipping pitches or something, or just like totally off mechanically in the stretch. Um, because he has been awful, like super, super worrisome for Sandy. And even at a reduced price tag here, 7,900, this is another bad matchup for him, strikeout-wise. So the floor is not going to be there for Sandy, even though he's still running deep into games. They're often just letting him go too far. And when he gets up into the 90-plus pitch sort of territory, he starts pitching to more contact, and that's when he gives up two, three runs in the seventh inning or whatever, and and it totally torches his outing. So it makes it very difficult to play here, even though the underlying metrics are, for the most part, pretty okay. Um, he's just got no change of value and no strikeout upside anymore. So when he pitches to a lot of contact, as he has in his last two starts, 10 hits and 10 hits in each of his last two, there's a lot of opportunity for production and for him to not strand runners. So um, super difficult in this particular matchup against Boston. I think they're in play. I'm more attracted to a 4,200 Alex Verdugo now than his previous price tag earlier in the season. Uh, finally, we're seeing him drop off a little bit. Justin Turner, not super thrilled about that. Like, I don't want to go after Sandy necessarily because I still respect the arm. But he's going to pitch to a lot of contact, and the suppression has not been there this season. So uh, I think that's very much in play to get to well-priced Boston stacks. Yoshida's is 51. That's fine. Devers is 54. Also fine. Adam Duvall at 49, I'm not thrilled about. But uh, Tristan Casas, 26. Yeah, okay. It, it, like, it's fine. Connor Wong's got some pop against righties. I think, I think Boston stacks are in play kind of off the board here because Sandy's been pitching to so much contact this year, and he can't. He just can't strand anybody. 
Um, no changeup value, no strikeout stuff. So I think uh, you got to side with Boston here as opposed to Sandy. Um, 7,100 on the mound for Whitlock. Now, I really want Whitlock to be a lot better. Unfortunately, I just don't think he's going to be until he introduces a secondary fastball. You cannot just throw a two-seamer, man. It, it, if you only have three pitches, you can't do it. If you're only a, a roughly neutral ground ball to fly ball guy, and that's kind of what he is. Two left-handers, he's even got a fly ball lean here, and that's going to give him problems. He's got a 41% hard contact rate here with a 231 ISO allowed. 178 X ISO to both sides. Um, now he's very efficient early in the count, but that doesn't really matter if you're only throwing a two seamer. Your changeup is likely to be bad because a two seamer is not a very good pitch to opposite hand up, opposite handed hitters. So he's going to have problems giving up power. And if you're throwing a righty righty change, this is not generally unless it's really 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 good not generally a same-handed pitch, so you're going to give up a little bit of power there too. So he needs something else in the arsenal. He has to introduce a cutter or start throwing some sort of you know, curveball to induce some more swing and miss. He just doesn't have it at the moment. So a 21% K rate, I've got to kind of jump off the train here against Miami, even though this is Miami. Um, they do get Jazz Chisholm and Gene Segura back tonight, and against right-handed pitching, uh, Jazzy's one of the best power hitters from the left side in baseball. So we'll have to see what they want to do. Luis Rai is not going to strike out. Georgie Soler is Georgie Soler. And with a lower and de depressed strikeout rate to the right side for Whitlock, not getting a lot of swing and miss with the slider, that puts Georgie Soler in play, right? Jesus Sanchez from the left side, he's well-priced and makes the Jazz Chisholm, Soler, and, you know, do you really want to play Luis Rai at second base, 5,100 on a 15-game slate? Probably not. But it makes you know, the cheaper guys like the Jesus Sanchez, Brian De La Cruz, Garrett Cooper, whatever, it makes the Jazzy and the and the Jorge Soler, the guys you do want to play, a little bit more attainable. So I think I'm going to have to leave Garrett Willock on the shelf here because of the lack of a, a secondary fastball. Uh, it's just a bad pitch. I think that puts Miami in play a little bit in deep tournament teams now that they get Jazzy back. He's 5,000, so we didn't, we're not really getting a... A price reduction on him necessarily. I, you don't want to play Gene Segura. He doesn't have any power anymore. So it'd be mostly the top half of the lineup. You can choose or choose not to include um, Luis Arise. But I, I do like Solaire. This game is in Fenway, right? And Fenway is going to play up right handed power a little bit uh, with the monster there. So I think offense definitely in play here. Probably just going to stay off of pitching for the most part. Uh, okay, let's move on to Minnesota and Atlanta. I would like to get to mostly pitching here, I think. Joe Ryan on the mound, 10-8. Now, I I played Sonny Gray against Braves yesterday, and unfortunately, he had, uh, you know, he was throwing really well, gave up a dinger in the seventh inning, and then, you know, Alex Kirloff at first base can't catch a, a line drive, and then Emilio Pagan comes in and, and hangs a curveball to freaking Ronald Acuna and hangs another run on Sonny Gray, which spoiled a really good outing from him. Now, I think Joe Ryan can perform similarly. I think Joe Ryan is a better overall arm than Sonny Gray. He's got more upside, certainly. He's more efficient because his fastball is better, even though Sonny throws three fastballs. He's got a better off-speed pitch. Um, so I want to I want to play some Joe Ryan. He's also just two two and a half percent owned right now. Now the projection is going to make it. You will have to force this in, and this is a tough matchup against the Braves once again. But as we talked about yesterday, there's some hidden strikeouts here for really good arms. Um, in the Braves lineup now Acuna is only striking out against righties this season, but like a 13 percent clip. So it's not necessarily going to come there. But I think, you know, Ozzie Albies, he's not been good. He's only getting 200 uh, against right-handers this year from the left side. Austin Riley, not all that impressive. He's really come off since his early season barrage. Now, Matt Olson, you got to be worried about him here because Joe Ryan's strikeout rate to the left side, similar to last night and Sonny Gray, 21%. Significant drop-off. But the strikeout split here is very similar to last night, right? 30 plus percent to the righties and not 30 plus percent right to the lefties far far lower Sonny is about 17 percent Joe Ryan here at 21 
Um, Joe Ryan, however, much less attackable. We'll give up a little bit of pop and some fly balls, heavy fly balls, to the right side here. 34% in 055 ground ball to fly ball. So that makes the righties over here from Atlanta, guys that will get it on the line a little bit more, like an Acuna, um, like an Austin Riley, Sean Murphy, etc., that does put them in play, and it makes it a dangerous matchup for Joe Ryan here because it's, you know, 85 degrees in Atlanta, and this is a hitter's ballpark down here when, it, when it's warm. So dangerous matchup for sure, but Joe Ryan's one of the few arms that has 35 in the tank every single outing he steps on the mound. Now, he did just throw a complete game shutout. I do like shorting pitchers after they have that kind of performance. But I think he's in play. I'm not wild about the price tag. Certainly not wild about the matchup. Don't get me wrong. But I think he's in play at very low ownership here. This is a v super shrewd tournament play. Um, if you could make something like this happen with, like, the Dodgers or something like that or a chalky Seattle or something, uh, I think this is pretty okay, to be quite honest. Uh, I think he's in play. Bryce Elder on the other side. I, I want to continue to short him, too, but, like, he just gets a good matchup every damn start, and it makes it super difficult for me to do it. Um, and he keeps performing, right? He had Philly in his last outing, went seven, struck out six, had Colorado. He got beat up by Washington um, in a very low strikeout matchup, but this is not a low strikeout matchup, right? 27% Ks against righties on this season in 2,300 PAs, like 103 W. We kind of know who the Twins are here. And they're going to strike out. They'll hit for a little bit of power. Um, you know, but for the most part, this offense just stinks, right? They're a break-even team. And sure enough, they're at uh, 500 at 40 and 40, right? So I think Bryce Elder's in play too. I'm not super wild about this price tag necessarily either. And I am looking for the regression to hit. The 85% strainer, I don't care who you are, or what kind of ground ball rate you have, it's just not sustainable long-term for a starting pitcher, Nobody's been able to do this. Why do we think that, you know, a, a rookie, so to speak, has, has been able to do this or is going to be able to do this for his whole career? I don't, so I'm going to keep taking shots and keep smashing my head in the door. 21% um, K rate it is not all that attractive, but once again, you know, the twin strikeout, they got Joey Gallo here that strikes out enough for like three guys. Um you know, Eddie Julian strikes out a lot, and Kirilov will strike out a little bit. Buxton strikes out a ton, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now they'll be pretty balanced. They might even have five righties in the light in the lineup here tonight. If that's the case, then yeah, that puts Bryce Elder in play even more because he's got such good ground ball stuff to the right side. If they go more left-handed heavy somehow, then you know, with like the Julian Kirilov, Gallo, Kepler, whoever the hell else they've got. Um, then that would probably take me off of Elder a little bit. And then maybe you play some of the twins, like the Gallo, like Max Kepler is 2,700. You could play Kirilov, he's 29. Eddie Julian is 31, right? You could play Buxton, even though he stinks. Um, it, it's, it's okay to get to a twin stack in that event where there's a lot of lefties in the lineup, but not my favorite, to be honest. And I think... It puts Bryce Elder in play, certainly at very low ownership. He has upside for 25 here, um, and I think this is a fine tournament play. So that's kind of mostly where I stand, mostly pitching here. If you want to play a one-off Brave or something, it's got to be just a Cunha uh, or a Matt Olson. Um, but you really want to be one-offing $6,100 first baseman? I mean, yeah, it's fine. It's in play. Um, but it's very difficult to convince me that uh, that Atlanta stacks are very much in play here. Um I'd much rather just play the Dodgers. I think it's super, It's way higher probability. We'll get to them in a little bit. Uh, okay, let's move on. Houston and St. Louis. Framber on the mound. I think this is another really damn good tournament play. 7% ownership here. Similar to Joe Ryan, up above 10,000. Nobody's going to be playing him. And he's one of the few guys that has 30 in the tank every single time he takes the mound in any given matchup. High ground ball stuff here, but he's got... I'd rather probably play Framber, right? The matchup is better. St. Louis is not as good an offense as Atlanta, of course. He's got ground ball stuff, does Framber. And he'll give up hard contact, but it's on the ground for the most part, so I'm mostly okay with that. And he's got whiff stuff, right? Similar to Joe Ryan, 30% to the lefties in a short sample, whatever. 26% still to the right-handers. The only question mark we've got with Framber is the bad changeup. He's throwing it a little bit less now, which is encouraging, but... 
uh, than, than he was earlier in the season. And it is just a five and a half to six mile an hour velo delta off of the fastball uh, in the two seamer. But he stays so far down in the strike zone that the changeup, I mean, he'll float this. And that's really the only vulnerability that he has. But with the fastball, the sinker slider curveball, he stays down enough in the strike zone that he can kind of get away with this. Um, not to say that that's, you know, you want to go out of your way to have a bad changeup that you throw in the middle of the plate. But it works because he's got such good ground ball stuff and he can induce whiffs. So that's really the only big question mark here. He's not going to walk people and he stays off the barrel here. For the most part, maybe a little bit of negative regression coming to him, right? Two and a quarter ERA with expected metrics run, run and a half even higher. Um, so does that put you onto the Cardinals? I mean, I don't want to pay 5900 for Paul Goldschmidt or 57 for Aaron Otto in this matchup. Same thing with Contreras behind the plate. I don't want to pay that, 4600 Price adjusted, it's 3200 Jordan Walker that I'm most attracted to here. Uh, 4300 for Tommy Edmond. Hits lefties well, but like... It's a normal price tag for him in a down matchup. So I'm not really excited about playing the Cardinals. I'd much rather just play Framber on the mound. And I want to play Houston as well against Jordan Montgomery. 7,200, I'm going to leave him on the shelf entirely tonight. Uh, probably just going to X him from the pools. He's got big problems against righties. I'd, I'd say big problems. He's got problems, right? 260 average allowed, 328 Woba. Not horrifying numbers there necessarily, but a 183 ISO allowed is certainly attackable. 22% K rate is certainly attackable. Neutral ground ball to fly ball, 36% hard, attackable for sure with a 22% line drive rate. He's very efficient early in the count, early in the count and he's elite against lefties, but this is a super right-handed heavy lineup, and this is not the matchup that you want to be eating um, any ownership whatsoever on Jordan Montgomery. 17% strikeout rate for the Strohs against righties, against lefties with all of their righties. This season, 107 WRC+, 168 ISO. It's uh, above average, not super attractive. Neutral ground ball to fly ball here. It's going to make them difficult to go after. 9% walk rate, right, with a little bit of hard, 32% hard contact. So I'm going to play some of these righties here where they're well-priced. Jose Altuve is fine at 5,000 flat. Alex Bregman, not so much necessarily. He's got dreadful numbers, to be quite honest, against lefties. Um, but he doesn't strike out a lot, so that's fine. Kyle Tucker at 57, probably leaving him on the shelf um, outside of stacks. Yiner Diaz and Jeremy Pena are the, the probably my two price-adjusted favorites here at 33 and 4,100, respectively. Maybe like a quarter jokes or a Chaz McCormick in the outfield depending on what they want to do. So that's how I'd like to attack Jordan Montgomery. Righties only, and probably just short stacks, I think. Because he's still a decent arm. Um, and I don't really want to play Bregman. Don't really want to play Tucker. Certainly don't want to play Jose Abreu. Even though he hit a ball out like three or four days ago or something like that. Um, so it's Altuve, Diaz, Pena, I think is the favorite with one of the cheap outfield guys, McCormick or Jokes. Okay, let's move on. Detroit and Texas. Um, similar spot for Detroit here tonight. They get Matt Manning back on the mound. Um, now, we're, we're not going to be playing him. I'm not playing him. He has been on the DL since early April with a busted foot. I believe he got hit with a line drive. Um, could be wrong about that, but he's back, and he looks to be healthy. He's had some good rehab starts, and the velocity is up a little bit. I don't really care. Even if he is 6,000, uh, this is Texas, and he's a an average to below average right-hander as it is. Um, so I want to go after that with Texas, even though they kind of disappointed a little bit last night. Um, they're still super, super dangerous. 117 WRC+, plus, 23% K rate, whatever, but 37% hard and a 185 ISO. Neutral ground ball to fly ball, good line drive rate here, 22% in aggregate. Every one of these guys in the lineup, you know, has got pretty, pretty good numbers. Um, you know, certainly against right-handers, absolutely. Even the right-handers up at the top of the lineup, Garcia and Semyon from the right side. They're expensive, 57, 53 for Semyon Garcia. And you got 6,000 for Corey Seager, but this is Corey Seager. I don't really care. Um, and Nate Lowe at 4,200. I think this is a fine play. Josh Young, 45, got a price drop. Thinks this is a fine matchup for him. And Jonah Heim behind the plate, 4,000, hitting a little bit better from the left side this season, showing a little bit more pop. And any one of the three outfielders down at the bottom of the lineup, whether it's Grossman, Zeke Duran, Leody, whoever, um, 
all playable for sure and all cheap. So they, they make the guys at the top a little bit more attainable. Very intriguing game stack here because I want to kind of go after Martin Perez as well. 5,700 on the mound for him. He's going to see 11% against against the Tigers. I think that's ridiculous. I know that the price tag is cheap, um, but this is a sneaky, okay team against left-handed pitching are the Tigers. We talked about this yesterday, and they they really jumped on Andrew Heaney. Now, Martin Perez is not going to give up as much hard contact as Heaney, so I'm, a, I'm less on Texas tonight than I was yesterday. And, you know, this is, uh, or excuse me, less on Detroit than I, I was yesterday. Um, and this is a 15-game slate. You don't really want to be playing Detroit necessarily on a 15-game slate. But these guys are popping top five in value, top six in value so far, mostly because they're cheap, but they've got good numbers against left-handers, right? 22.5% K rate, 9.5% walk rate, 36% hard contact, sneaky pop here at 165 ISO. So, um... I think Martin Perez, he's not really been all that great this season. Um, he's popped for a couple of starts here or there, but for the most part, been mostly pretty unimpressive. What, one, two, three starts above, uh, four starts above 20 DK points? And everything else has been, you know, in the mid to low teens, as a matter of fact. So uh, I think Detroit, where they're very well priced, and pretty much every one of them is, they're all in play. Veerling is probably going to lead off again, 2,500. Torque at 32, got a price drop. Andy Abanez hit a bomb last night, also got a price drop. 2,200, I really like that. Javi Baez, not so much, but he's 3,600 now as opposed to 39 yesterday. Much more playable, even though he's Javi Baez and he stinks. Eric Haas uh, had a triple last night somehow uh, on a misplay ball in the outfield. And... Jake Rogers hit a ball out. So either one of the catchers are in play. The guys at the bottom of the lineup outside of Zach Short, probably not in play, um, you know, on full 15 gamer. I think there's a really intriguing game stack, as a matter of fact, going after Martin Perez, going after Matt Manning, and you can stack these cheap Tigers pieces with the very expensive, all of them, Texas Rangers on the other side, and you can still make this happen. So it's a really intriguing game stack. I think this is a a fun build and it's not going to be played um you know all that much necessarily because this is a 15 game slate and there's a ton of teams so uh very much playable offense wise here i'm going to stay off of pitching uh okay let's move on to philly and and the uh, cubs ranger suarez on the mound i think he's in play here at 7000 uh but i think the cubs on the other side are also in play i like shorting ranger suarez because i don't trust the two seamer that he throws it's not very good um and he doesn't get all that much swing and miss, right? Certainly to, to right-handed hitters, he's still susceptible a little bit. Definitely an average allowed. 282 so far with a 270 XBA in aggregate. 340 Woba, it's a pretty big number. It's not buoyed because of a, you know, egregiously high walk rate or anything. That's just at 9%. 161 ISO gives up a little bit of pop there. 37% hard contact. That's mostly the two-seamer rearing its head. And a four-seamer also for a guy that doesn't throw all that hard, not necessarily a whiff pitch. So he's attackable, does induce 23% Ks, um, you know, but a buck 60 ground ball to fly ball, some of the fly ball hitters over here from the Cubs, they are in play due to that. So um, I think I'd probably just side with Ranger Suarez. I like the price tag for him here at 7,000. I mean, he's a really strong projection and killer value score. So far, these numbers will change and adjust throughout the day. But if this persists, you're probably going to be pretty hard pressed at 8% ownership to not get a good bit of Ranger Suarez. Get probably double, even triple the field at this particular price tag. He's going to make a lot of things work. And the Cubs overall, even though their aggregate numbers against left-handers are pretty strong, they've been pretty damn cold in the last couple of weeks, um, last month really. Striking out a, a quite a bit more. We'll see what they want to do with the lineup. Nico, Say Suzuki, maybe even a Chris Morell up at the, um, maybe in the three hole, something like that. Dansby at a playable 4,600. All the, I think these guys are very much playable. Um, I like these numbers in aggregate, and I think Nico is fine at 54. He's kind of a stiff second base play at that price tag, but Saya at 41 is really attractive, I think. Uh, Jan Gomes behind the plate or a Miguel Amaya, either one of those guys are very much playable. Maybe a Nick Madrigal down at the bottom in a wraparound or something. He didn't strike out. He's really a pest down there. Um, 
so these right-handers here, I think, are very much in play. Probably short stacks, I think. I generally like going after Ranger Suarez, um, but it, he can make it hard because he does... Like, he's efficient. He's not a terrible arm here, necessarily. But he's still susceptible to giving up a little bit of pop to the right side. So, uh, would like to get to some Seiya Suzuki, maybe a Chris Morell. That's, you can stomach 5,000 for him when he's in the three-hole. Not so much when he's in the nine-hole. And Dansby Swanson, probably my favorite price-adjusted plays there. But I really like Nico. Love playing him always. And Miguel Amaya, Orion Gomes, as I mentioned. Very much in play. Uh, as is Ranger. Jamison Tyon, not so much in play for me. 6,200, uh, he's totally out of play. I'm just going to X him. And even though it's a cheap price tag, uh, I don't want anything to do with him. He's got dreadful numbers against lefties this season. 311 average allowed, 437 Woba, and a 321 ISO with a 15% strikeout rate. He's got a horrible walk rate, too. He's 050 ground ball to fly ball, 33% hard contact rate, 2.8 homers per nine. 11.5% barrel rate in aggregate. No thank you. He throws a lot of strikes, but he pitches to so much contact, it's not all that impressive velocity-wise. He's not going to throw it past anybody, right? Just a 19% aggregate strikeout rate. So give me the Phillies here. I think it's a really, really good stack. Um, now, they're expensive, and those price tags are going to you know, keep, them, keep their ownership down. 55 for Schwarber, 56 for Trey, 59 for Harper, 54 for JTR. That's uh, you know not easy to make happen. Castellanos makes it a little bit better at 43, and some of the guys down at the bottom, they're fine stack fillers at cheaper price tags as well. Uh, but I really want to go after Jamison Tyon here. Uh, I think Phillies are a very intriguing stack, um, even though overall against right-handers this season, the Phillies have been less than impressive, to say the least. 101 WRC+, plus, 9% walk rate, mostly from Schwarber. 23.5% K rate, average there, average there. 150 ISO, average. 30% hard contact, below average, right? So not overly impressive are the Phillies, but this is a really, really good matchup for them, especially for Schwarber and Harper to kind of um, get off the schneid a little bit. Trey has also hit right-handers very well historically, and James Tyler's is not going to throw it past him necessarily. So uh, I like getting the, a little bit of offense here. If I had to choose, it's Phillies, then Ranger, then the Cubs, I think. But the Ranger and the Cubs plays, I think, are, are pretty um, pretty close. No Jamison Tyon for me. Okay, let's move on to Cleveland and Kansas City. Um, we are going pretty long here, but uh, we have a lot more games to get over to go through. Gavin Williams, I, I think I want to play him, go right back to him. We haven't really talked about him. He's a high upside right-hander with good stuff, right? He's got a four-pitch mix that he's comfortable using. All right, and spreading usage out. Now, we can't really take a lot out of the usage necessarily. Uh, certainly nothing out of the value in just the one start. Um, but he walks some guys. Really, the problem with him is likely to be control. He has walked. He's got good suppression numbers in the minors. You know, Mid-2s ERA, something like that. But he's he's walked a solid two guys per outing um, between double and triple A this season. So... If you want to go after him with a couple of short Royal stacks and, and capitalize on what's likely to be uh, some high variance in the in the control, I think that's viable. Playing Bobby Witt, he's at a playable 53 now. 51 for Salvi is always fine. And Nick Prado probably be the favorites there. If you want to throw in some of the other guys, MJ, Mikel Garcia, you know, super cheap Samad Taylor or Drew Water, something like that, like, it's fine to make a five stack. Go after a young arm that could have control problems. Not my favorite here because the Royals are dreadful against right-handed pitching. I'd rather just like take shots again on Gavin Williams at 5,900. He's going to make a lot of stuff work, and he's only 5% owned. So another one of these arms in the 6K range, I'd rather play him than David Peterson, for example. Um, you know, even though he, Peterson's got much more of a history, Gavin Williams is a what I think a better arm. You know, he's got more upside, and he's got a better matchup, I think. So. Um, you know, just give me him at half the ownership or, or whatever it is, quarter of the ownership to David Peterson, for example. So that's kind of how I'd, I'd like to approach it. Um, do I want to play Cleveland going after Brady Singer here? Uh, probably not. I mean, you could play a piece here or there, I think. Stephen Kwan, 41. Josie Ramirez, you can always play, of course. Uh, Josh Naylor, you can play because he's got probably the most pop from the left side outside of Josie. Outside of that, I don't want to play Cleveland. I don't want to stack them. It, they're popping in value because Brady Senior has been really, really bad. Super attackable all season. It's similar numbers to Tyon, right? 
and that puts Cleveland in play. But you want to get there with, I mean, try and get there with a Cleveland stack on a 15-game slate. I mean, be my guest. Super unlikely to happen. They have a 122 aggregate, 122 aggregate ISO against right-handed pitching this year, 89 WRC+. They don't strike out, sure, but they don't make any hard contact whatsoever. They don't hit the baseball out. So it's got to be full stacks if you want to get there. And do I really want to be shorting Brady Singer, a guy I think he's trying to turn it around here. Um, And this is a good matchup to continue that sort of bottoming and and turnaround process for him, even though his last start was, you know, again, not very good. They do just leave him out there a lot of the time to just get bludgeoned, go seven innings, he'll, he'll give up eight runs or whatever it is. Um, they've done that a couple of times with him this season. So that could, you know, give you a little bit more upside for Cleveland, but like, man, they are just dreadful overall and not super attractive to me outside of stack fillers, um, or lineup fillers rather in like one-off pieces with Steven Kwan, who's leading off, right? Josie Ramirez, who is still the best hitter on the team or Josh Naylor. I don't know. And everybody else, I don't really want to play. Maybe it's super cheap Bo Naylor piece. Eh, eh, not super interested. So um, kind of off of most of the offense here because I, this could be a really, really bad baseball game. Could end like 2 nothing or something in an hour and 46 minutes. I mean, th- these teams are just awful. So no thanks. Could also, you know, in the same vein, you know, see a, a 10-8 ball game because – you know, the teams are awful. All right, let's get to Coors Field. Dodgers and the Rockies. We could probably go pretty quickly through this. You're going you're to want to play every single one of the Dodgers. They get Connor Seabold on the mound. We're not playing him, not going near him. Um, even at 5,000, he'd have to be free for me to consider playing him tonight against the Dodgers at Coors Field. They're going to get Max Muncy back tonight, um, definitely. Dave Roberts said he was gonna, going to be activated. The problem is just the pricing, and it's the ownership. Now... This is a 15-game slate. You're not going to be... You'll see these guys at, you know, a couple of them at 20%. Mookie, definitely. Freddie, definitely. Something like that. Um, but overall, you're not going to have to worry about ownership too much necessarily. So it's not going to be super difficult to make the Dodgers happen. And to be quite honest, I tried it out this morning. You can build the most expensive stack here with the Dodgers. Mookie, Freddie, Will Smith, Max Muncy, and J.D. Martinez with a cheap secondary stack and two cheap arms. You can make it happen. So, you know, keep that in mind. Um, That will pop their ownership a little bit because there's plenty of value. It's a 15-game slate. It's not hard to find a cheap hitter here or there that can help you save some money. Um, But what I'm mostly intrigued here, it's, it's of course, with the offense, right? It's really with Kershaw. I want to play some 9,700 Kershaw. Now, I know he still throws a curveball. And, did you know, that pitch, of course, doesn't work at Coors Field. Um, but this Kershaw, like, I'm not super worried about that. He's moved, up, moved a, a lot of this curveball usage over to the slider over the last couple seasons. And he's not nearly as susceptible, at least in the raw arsenal, uh, to getting just totally blown apart at, at Coors as he was earlier in his career when he was throwing mostly four-seamer curveball. He's mostly four-seamer slider now, plays a little bit better. So healthy Kershaw here, the numbers are fantastic, right? He's running about five ticks hot to his career averages in the strand rate too, and this is at Coors Field, et cetera, et cetera. If we are going to see some regression, that's where it's going to come, right? Might you know, give up a soft single or something and then a bomb or, or whatever it is. Yeah, it's all possible this is Coors Field. But the Rockies are horrific against left-handed pitching, I want to continue to go after them, even though I have been looking for a bounce. I'm not going to be looking for a bounce for them against Kershaw. Um, 67 WRC plus 27% K rate, 151 ISO. They're hitting for a little bit more power recently, and they do get CJ Crone back tonight. He was activated yesterday, and they might get, um, not tonight, they might get Chris Bryant back as well. He's going out on a rehab. So Zeke Tovar with sort of hangover daddy power, I suppose. Um, You could play him. I'm okay playing that, but I don't want to play C.J. Crone at 4,800 against Kershaw. You could play Elias Diaz at 45, showing a little bit more power recently. I think that's okay. Um, If you want to get off of some of the Kershaw, I mean, do you really need to? You're not getting leverage here. He's 6% owned. I, I want to play a good bit of this. And I think that's how you can try and differentiate in your Dodgers stacks. You're not going to be able to get the 
five most expensive guys and Kershaw necessarily, unless you punt on the mound and punt your secondary stack. Um, so you probably have to play one or maybe even two of David Peralta, Jason Hayward, Miggy Vargas, James Outman at the bottom to fit in Kershaw as well. But I think that's fine. And I'm going to try and, and squeeze that in and make that happen. I really like Kershaw in this spot tonight. Uh, I think he's a really cool tournament play. Everybody's going to be on mostly the offense here. And I think Kershaw is very much playable. Um, I'm not dealing with anybody outside of Zeke Tovar and Elias Diaz. Maybe a short CJ Krohn stack with those other two or a Brent Doyle or something. But, I mean, I don't want to go after Kershaw here. I'm really on mostly the Dodgers. I think laying 3-1 to one on the road here is probably a short number, to be quite honest. Okay, let's move on. White Sox Angels going really long here. Uh, Michael Kopech, 8,800. I'm going to have to leave him on the shelf. It's the 12% walk rate and the 15% barrel rate, 14% barrel rate here. He's given a pop to both sides. It's mostly to the right-handers in terms of hard contact. Um, 241 ISO allowed, 36.5% hard with a 2.2 homers per nine. He's given up 16 bombs and 15 starts this year. He's also a stone lock to give up a homer, similar to, I believe it was Tyler Wells that we talked about earlier. Um, he's got some, some whiff stuff, right? He's been better recently, but uh, Kopech still very much tackable with a 12% walk. Like his last two starts have not been good. Uh, only went four and a third against Seattle, struck out just four, walked six batters, right? Went four innings in his last start against Texas, gave up three runs, walked three batters. So he's got a little bit of a floor because of some strikeout stuff. And we saw what Dylan Cease did to them last night. But like Dylan Cease doesn't have the, like he doesn't have a barrel rate at 14%, even though he's got a, a bad walk rate himself. Um, Kopech more expensive, so I, I'd rather get to the Angels tonight. Yeah, much more so than I, I wanted to last night. Um, you can go after Kopech here because, it, like, he can't throw strike one. He walks way too many people, and he elevates his pitch count. I think at 8,800, I think he's too expensive to be eating these kinds of numbers. This is super concerning here for him those two metrics alone, he really just doesn't have a lot of chase either. So he's, th he's got to throw strikes later in the count in the strike zone to get all the swing and miss, and that elevates pitch count. So, um, you know, really not likely to be super deep for this game either. He needs good matchups to really excel like Detroit, like Cleveland, like Kansas City, and like Minnesota. Those are the outings where he's really popped hard. And against every other team that is more patient and makes more barrel contact, like the Angels, um, yeah, yeah, he has struggled pretty mightily this season. So uh, I'm leaving Kopech on the shelf. Shohei Otani, yeah, but up here in the 10 plus K range, I mean, I, I think he's fine. Uh, once again, we got to keep an eye on the ownership. This is probably going to be higher by the time we get into lock. Huge projection naturally. We saw what uh, a you know, far lower upside arm, I would say, um, did to them last night in Reed Detmers, right? This is Shohei. Problem is, Shohei is 11,300, and you're not going to be able to make this happen unless you punt your secondary arm and your secondary stack to it, get to the Dodgers or another expensive stack, right? Um, so that's going to be super difficult to make happen, but I've got no problems getting to him, of course. Um, he looks like he's kind of turning the corner, at least on the mound production-wise. Right, His last outing against the Dodgers was fantastic. Seven innings, struck out 12. Uh, I don't see any reason that he couldn't do this here again tonight. Need to see the walk rate tick down, and it did. It has in his last couple of starts. Walked one and, and two in his last two starts. So uh, attractive for sure, and... This is how I, I would kind of like to approach if I'm getting it, you know, getting to an arm this expensive. I do like Joe Ryan, but it's got to just be Shohei, I think, if I'm getting all the way up here, um, even as opposed to like a Kevin Gosman or something. But uh, no problems if you can make this happen. Uh, I'm fine with, with playing Shohei against a, a really bad offense. Uh, and they're very right-handed heavy. They're going to strike out a lot in this matchup against Shohei, right? 35% K rate to the right side. He's even got a 30% K rate to the lefties. Um, a lefty here or there, if you want to get off of some of the likely higher ownership, maybe a Ben Intendi, but like, no thank you. Gavin Sheets? Eh, no thanks. So, writing the White Sox off completely for me tonight. Um, 
favorite Angels plays probably just got to be Mike Trout, I think, since Kopech gives up more hard contact. But he's going to strike out a lot in this matchup, I think. Um, you know, so I'm kind of lukewarm on the Angels as as stacks because you can't play Shohei. But uh, if you want to go after Kopech, I think they're very much in play. They're going to miss the cut, I think, for me. Um, you know, which I guess should put Kopech in play. But I have serious concerns about this walk rate and this barrel rate. So, yeah. Kind of uh, not impressed. All right, Tampa and Arizona, 9,400 for Taj Bradley on the mound. I think he's a pretty shrewd tournament play. Uh, definitely on the late slate. Um, he'll be more popular, of course, there, but I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get to him on the on the main slate. Um, this is a bad matchup, right? And Arizona's a really, really good offense over here, man. Buck 10 WRC plus, 19% strikeout rate, hard contact, good power at a 180 ISO, and they get it. You know, they're pretty balanced, batted ball-wise. Buck 20, ground ball to fly ball. 266 average and a 337 Woba. Those are really good numbers. Now, I mostly like attacking with Arizona against below-average right-handed arms. Taj Bradley, Taj Bradley is not necessarily that. He's got really good K stuff. I think that puts him in play. Um, on the late slate, I think the offenses in this game are in play. On the main slate, it's probably just got to be mostly pitching. I'm... Ugh. Not really thrilled about Zach Gallon at 15% ownership against Tampa on a 15-game slate at 9,900 necessarily. So if I had to choose, it'd probably be Bradley. But like, let's not get it confused here. This is two really good baseball teams, two really good arms, definitely, but two really good offenses also. So I think that kind of takes them at their particular price tags out of play for me. Um, so I'm not super thrilled about eating ownership on Gallon or going after Arizona necessarily, or Tampa, you know, for for that matter. So, um, you know, there's nothing wrong fundamentally with these guys necessarily, right? Gallon is is Gallon, and Taj Bradley's been very good in his 10 starts this season. Really, really good numbers. Um, you know, gives up a little bit of pop and some hard contact to the right side. So that'd be like a Christian Walker who's swinging an incredible bat right now, um, or a Lourdes or something like that. But now Christian Walker's 5,000. Corbett is 6,300. Right, Cattel Marte's 53. So do you really want to stack these guys against a, an above-average arm? Probably not. Probably not. Um, certainly not on the main slate. They're well down the list, I think. On the late slate, I, I do think they just kind of have to be in play because they're a potent offense. Um, same thing with Taj, though. He's definitely in play. He's a potent arm. Same thing with Gallon on the other side. I, I think the approach really from both sides or all sides of this game is everybody is in play you know, pitchers mostly on the on the main slate, offenses mostly on the late slate. One-offs here or there if you land on them, but, like, I'm not going to go out of my way to be playing these guys. They're at their normal price tags in down matchups, so uh, pretty much all the way around. So it's kind of a write-off game for me in terms of DFS, but should be a really good baseball game to watch, I think. Okay, let's move on to Washington, Seattle. You can get to Seattle again here against Jake Irvin. He didn't strike anybody out. He's 5,100 uh, price tag tonight. No ownership, so that's nice. But I don't think you need to get all the way down here, even though Seattle is bad against right-handed pitching. They did put up a pretty good number against Trevor Williams last night, but Trevor Williams is a grease fire. So 17.5% K rate for Irvin, 12% walk rate. No thanks. The, those two numbers right there um, are enough to take me off of Jake Irvin pretty much exclusively, unless it's against a team that's very right-handed heavy, number one, and they make a lot of soft contact. Um Seattle is bad against righties, right? 26% K rate nearly. But they don't make enough soft contact. I'd like to see this a little bit higher if I were to consider playing Trevor Williams or playing a Jake Irvin or something like that, right? So I think Seattle is very much in play again, and they're going to be, you know, of the cheaper stacks, um, you know, pretty popular once again. Julio is only 51. I think it's a damn good play. Ty France, all of the power is totally gone, but uh, he's 3,400 in the three hole. Kind of got a just play it. JP hit a ball out somehow because, well, Trevor Williams stinks. Um, 3,100 for him. Still at shortstop leading off. That's fine. Tay Oscar at 36. This is a pretty decent matchup for him again because Jake Irvin's not going to throw it past him necessarily. Um, even though Gino hit a ball out last night, yeah, I'm still just lukewarm on playing him. He's likely to make a good bit of soft contact here tonight. Jake Irvin doesn't do soft to the right side. He's got a, got a really strong hard to soft contact ratio to the righties. It's mostly lefties that you want to go after Irvin with, and that's JP, that's Cal Raleigh, that's Jared Kelnick, even a Mike Ford. 
um, if you can't quite get to a 3,400 tie France or something like that, or if you're playing a bunch of Seattle teams, Mike Ford's a good way to differentiate. East to Stone Men at 2,000 first base. Um, Jared Kelnick been pretty cold, but he's 4,300. Very playable still. Cal Raleigh, I really I, I like against most righties in baseball from the left side of the plate, 44 for him. And, of course, you could play Julio and France, Teoscar, whoever. Seattle, very much in play. As is Brian Wu, he's going to be the one in the 6-7K to 7K range. He's garnering all the ownership. I think it's fine. He's got fine strikeout stuff. Uh, this is a horrible strikeout matchup. Um, so I think what we're really concerned with here is Brian Wu going deep enough into the game to realize a good bit of a floor. And sure, he could go five innings and strike out seven. That's within range for him. Uh, but I think I'd probably like to stay off at this particular ownership. He's going to unlock a lot of stuff for you and unlock mostly the Dodgers, right? So we talked about this with David Peterson. These guys in the 6K range are going to be popular, but you're also, if you're playing them with Dodger stacks, which is what they open up for you, you know, they're going to be more, the most popular stack today as well. So, um, you know, it's not a horribly outsized figure, the ownership on the Dodgers. You know, but this is a 15-game slate, and they're seeing, what, aggregate 12, 13% ownership right now uh, for everybody on the team. So that's a high, high number given that we've got 30 teams going. So that said, with Brian Wu here, if you eat ownership on the mound and you also then go play a chalky secondary pitcher or primary pitcher in this case, um, now you've got a chalky stack, two chalky hitter or uh, pitchers. Now you got to go and differentiate with your secondary stack. And there's only so many that are going to make it work with the guys from the Dodgers that you want to play, for example. So um, that takes me off of it a little bit, but like can't ignore a 17-point nearly projection for a guy at 7,000. Look at this value score, 37.5 for a guy down here this cheap. Um, that It's going to be pretty hard to come off of this if you just build a bunch of teams. So that puts him in play. If I had to choose, you know, build like hand-build teams at 3 max or whatever, I'd probably come off of it. He wouldn't be my first guy in. But it, he's very much in play in deep tournament stuff. I think having ownership exposure here, is a pretty damn good idea. This game is still in Seattle, and this is still Washington. Even though they hopped on Luis Castillo a little bit last night, uh, they're still bad, and he still went seven innings and struck out seven. So, um, you know, Luis Castillo, Brian Wu's not Luis Castillo, but he still has plenty of upside in this matchup to get after Washington. They're just a bad offense. 130, they're similar to Cleveland, right? 130 ISO here, buck 50 ground ball to fly ball, 19% strikeout rate. So um, I'd approach them in the same manner pretty much. But really, I'd prefer Brian Wu to um, like a Brady Singer, for example, because the, well, the Nationals just have way f fewer guys that are going to hit the ball over the wall. Um, Cleveland actually has a couple there. So that's kind of how I'd like to approach it uh, with Washington. I'm just not going to play any of them. If you want to play like late slate or like turbo slate, um, sort of, yeah, I'd I don't know, late night slate sort of hedge pieces with Washington. Like, sure, go ahead, I guess. Like Luis Garcia, Corey Dickerson, maybe. Jamer, I guess. But uh, not super attractive on the main slate pretty much at all. Okay, let's move on to the last game of the night, I believe. Yankees-Oakland. We're going really long here. Sorry, guys. Uh, 6,400 for Brito. I think he's in play at this price tag. Um, if I'm going to pivot in the, in the 6K range, I think this is in play. He gets Oakland, and Oakland's going to go pretty left-handed heavy against him tonight. Now, the the worry is that he didn't strike anybody out. I think he's got six innings in him, though, in suppression. So that's kind of how I'd like to go after it. Um, you know, I'd much rather just play Brian Wu, you know, if I could find the 500. But if I'm looking for a pivot, I think Brito is in play. Uh, not thrilled with the lack of strikeout stuff, of course, and he gives up a lot of power to the right side. Um, but he's had a couple of outings this season that have been sort of inflated you know, against the Twins in particular, when they just blasted him twice, I believe. Um, in any case, he's given up a, a bit too much pop for my liking at 253 ISO to the right side with a 349 Woba. Walking too many lefties, 12% so far in the short sample. And a little bit of hard contact, right? 32.5% in aggregate to both sides. 10% walk rate's concerning. 
or notable at least, with an 11% barrel rate. But he is in play because this is Oakland. They're going to go so left-handed heavy. His numbers against lefties so far are a little bit better. Um, and their righties have not been good, to say the least. Right, Brent Rooker is hitting, what, sub-200 over the last two months. So um, not all that attractive. Ledmus Diaz is still cheap. He'd probably be the righty that you end up getting to, or a Shea Langoliers or something. Esturi Ruiz, they're probably going to shove him down in the nine hole against a righty here. So kind of hard to get to that at 3,900. But he is in play. I think he's got six inning upside in him, give up a run or two or something. Um, if he does give up like two runs, though, that it's kind of hard for him to make that back up. So he's got to go deep. Um, not my favorite down here, but he's in play. For sure. As is Paul Blackburn on the other side, 7,700. I think he's very much in play against the Yankees. However, Yankees are super cheap here. Outside of Glaber, Glaber's 52, but Harrison Bader's 36. Rizzo is 3,700. Stanton, who sucks, is 4,600, but you could play him. Um, Jake Bauer is 25. Josh Donaldson is probably on his on the hot seat here. Um, he's going to get some playing time, but like after a meeting with the manager, like... I could be pretty confident that they told him, yo, Josh, you're about to get DFA'd here, so you better pick it up. So maybe you see a little bit of a narrative bounce or something from Josh Donaldson against Paul Blackburn. That They're all cheap. You can play Billy McKinney. You can play Volpe. You can play Higgs or Trevino behind the plate or whatever. Yankee stacks are in play here. However, there's a horrible ballpark. And Paul Blackburn's actually not dreadful, right? Um He's only got the five starts this year because he had, like, a cracked fingernail and a blister or something. Uh, some kind of shenanigans. Um, but two of his last three starts have been pretty damn good. His last start was against Cleveland. He didn't. He gave up four runs, but he struck out seven in five innings, right? Struck out nine rays in five and two-thirds. That's pretty damn good. And he struck out five Brewers in what was his, what, second start, I guess? He got beat up a little bit by Miami, his first start coming back. Um or getting activated, at, uh, second start. You know, he And he was fine against uh, Atlanta, right? Struck out six in four innings. So I think there's hidden upside here for some Blackburn. 7,700, this price tag is probably going to keep him out of range for a lot of um, people here tonight. But the ownership, I think, should put us on. I think he's in play because the Yankees, man, this is a good ballpark in Oakland. The Yankees have been awful against pretty much everybody, top to bottom. Now, their price tags are, are starting to put them in play. So I think Yankee stacks are in play, but I think Blackburn is in play as well. He's been very efficient, right? 71% strike one is fantastic. He's got a 26% K rate here, giving up a little bit of pop to the righties, but he's got a short sample here in 13 innings against the right side, 12 and two-thirds against lefties. We're going to see this normalize a little bit. So far, not walking anybody and staying off of the barrel. Good chase, 33%, and he's got a 28% CSW. This is playable here. He's just pitching to a little bit too much contact with a buck 50 whip. If these uh, plate discipline and bat of ball numbers persist at an 87-mile-an-hour average exit velo, you're going to see this whip tick down, and that puts Blackburn in play. I think he's a really interesting tournament play. Um I'm a little concerned with upside, right, and going a full six innings and striking out seven or eight or something like that. Uh, it is, I would love to see seven innings and strike out nine or something out of him. Um, he stretched out enough to make that happen. I think you could take some punts on Paul Blackburn here tonight and play some Yankees on the other side, definitely on the late slate uh, because they're so well-priced. But on the main slate, maybe some short stacks of... The power guys, or Glaber, Stanton, Rizzo, or, you know, Harrison Bader or something, if he's up in the two-hole, something like that. I think that's very much in play. Uh, okay, I believe that's it. Um, how many more games are there? So many games. Uh, okay, so let's um, let's wrap it up. Go quickly through a review here. Since he in Baltimore, I want to get to Baltimore again against Andrew Abbott. Um, probably going to leave him on the shelf at the price tag. Tyler Wells, he's very much in play. But he will give up a little bit of pop. So if you want to play a one-off here or there from Cincinnati, difficult at their price tags to get to full stacks here for the Reds. San Diego and Pittsburgh, no Rich Hill for me. Good bit of you, Darvish, I think. Um, in the 8K range, I think it's a pretty decent matchup. But some off-the-board sort of short Pittsburgh stacks, G1 Bay, Kutch, Cabrian Hayes, Palacios, or even a Jackson Winsky, uh, they, all these guys are in play a little bit against Darvish. 
to get some leverage on the field. San Francisco, and you could play San Diego too. It's just price tags and comparing them to the Dodgers here tonight against Richfield. It makes them a good tournament play, but a lot of their upside is priced in. They're very expensive. San Francisco, Toronto, Giants are an intriguing tournament stack always. Probably not so much against Kevin Gosman here tonight. Gosman's fine, 11,000. I prefer Otani if I'm getting all the way up there. But, um, you know, Gosman's fine because San Francisco's still going to strike out a lot. Gosman, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't think you have to eat a, a full 11,000, which is probably going to take me off both Gosman and Otani. Um, but I think, you know, they're certainly in play. Toronto, for sure, against Alex Wood. He gives up a little bit too much power against righties. But they're expensive, too. Um, and their bullpen shenanigans over here with the Giants, I mean, it makes them hard to... Uh, you know, really attack in bullpen games. So Toronto's been pretty underwhelming against righties or against lefties this so far this season. Milwaukee and the Mets. Uh, Julio Toronto, I'm probably just going to stay off here. I don't like the strikeout matchup. I think he's due to get blown apart at some point. Are the Mets good enough to do that? Probably not, but you can always play Pete Alonso and Frankie Lindor. You play Brandon Nimmo too. I think that's a, a pretty well-adjusted um, price tag for him at 4000 flat. Milwaukee, I want to play against David Peterson, too. I think he stinks. And still looking for more positive regression for Milwaukee against lefties. Owen Miller, probably my favorite from the Brewers. But uh, I think pretty much anybody in the top half of the lineup or anybody down at the bottom is very much playable due to price tags. Uh, Miami and Boston, I think both offenses are in play here. I just can't play Sandy, and I can't really play Whitlock. Sandy because of the bad change. Whitlock because of the two-seamer. Um and Miami's getting their best left-handed hitter back, well, less, best left-handed power hitter, and it puts right-handers in play because Whitlock throws a righty-righty change too. Uh, so I think Miami off the board is a you know, really shrewd tournament stack is kind of in play here. Boston is too against Sandy, just hoping that he just he gets blasted and, and picked apart again, um, and they leave him in too long. So yeah, sure. They're well well priced here. I think Boston's pretty intriguing. Minnesota and Atlanta... Pretty much just pitching here for me, Joe Ryan and Bryce Elder. I think both of these guys are in play. Not super jacked about the price tags necessarily. Obviously for Joe Ryan, less bullish on that against Atlanta. Um, and Bryce Elder, only if they you know have like, what, five or even six righties in the lineup tonight. Um, I'm more bullish on him in, in that scenario. If they go six lefties, I'm less intrigued. And that probably takes him out of play for me a bit. Uh Probably no offense outside of maybe some one-offs. You can always play some one-off Atlanta, though. Or even full stacks there. That's that's fine with them in particular. Houston, St. Louis. Righties from, from Houston where they're well-priced against Jordan Montgomery. No lefties, I don't think. And Kyle Tucker's not very well-priced. So give me Josie Altuve and um, maybe a McCormick, Corey Jolks, certainly a Yiner Diaz, and uh, who else? Uh, Jeremy Pena. Um, they're well-priced. I think that's fine going after Jordan Montgomery. And... Probably no St. Louis here tonight for me. I mean, I don't really want to pay these price tags against Framber, even though he's got a really bad and susceptible changeup to right-handers. Um, not paying the same price tags for them necessarily. Detroit and Texas, playable game stack here for sure. Um, and you can obviously play them on their own. That's not a problem. Martin Perez and Matt Manning, I'm leaving both these guys on the shelf tonight. And I want to play... The offenses, uh, definitely going after Matt Manning, coming back up to the bigs after being on the DL for so long. And, um, you know, Detroit, where they're well-priced against Marti Perez, who's been overall pretty dreadful this season. Very attackable with some good right-handed power over here. Andy Abanez at 2,200, really like that again. Uh, Philly and the Cubs, I like Philly tonight. And a little bit of Ranger Suarez, he's very much in play. Tyon, not so much for me. Cubs are also in play against Ranger because I like going after his vulnerable two-seamer. Um... And I think they're well-priced. So interesting offensive tournament game here. Uh, but Ranger Suarez is very much in play in the 7K range. Cleveland, Kansas City. I'm not playing Cleveland outside of one-offs. They just can't get there on a full 15-game slate to win tournaments. Um, same thing with Kansas City. So mostly off of offense, but pieces here or there are in play. I like Avin Williams a little bit here against Cleveland or against uh, Kansas City at 5,900. That's fine. Dodgers, Colorado, all of the Dodgers, and all of the Kershaw for me. I really like this spot for him, um, even at Coors Field. Don't really care. If you want to play a spot on the other side, it would be Zeke Tovar, Elias Diaz, maybe a three-man with a C.J. Crone or something, or a cheap, uh, I don't know, Brent Doyle, maybe. Uh, it's, ugh, I, don't, I don't really want to do it. 
Um, so Dodgers pretty much exclusively just got to balance ownership and price tags there. White Sox, Angels, yeah, Otani. I don't want any of the White Sox. Otani, sure, if I get up all the way to this price range. Um, not sure how much it, that's really going to happen, though. I like Trout um, a little bit over here. He's probably my favorite from the right side. Kind of off of yeah, the Angels a little bit, but full stacks are in play. You can't play Otani, of course, but full stacks are in play because Michael Kopeck walks the whole country. Uh, no Kopeck for me here tonight. Um, despite attractive strikeout stuff, I think he's a bit overpriced given the walk and barrel metrics for him. Tampa and Arizona pitching only uh, on the main slate. Offense on the late slate is in play, I think. Uh, but I like both of these arms, not so much at their price tags um, in their particular matchup. So mostly a write-off for me for DFS, just going to miss the cut. But I would not be surprised if either one of these arms here pop for a really, really big number. Taj Bradley is super intriguing, as a matter of fact. More so than Zach Allen, I think. Even though I respect Zach Allen quite a bit more, I respect Tampa's offense a little bit more than Arizona. Washington, Seattle. Washington pieces only against Brian Wu, just as leverage. But Brian Wu, he's popping too hard, I think, in the value scores here so far down in this in this range. He's certainly the most popular um, play down here, and he's the best value score. So, yeah, let's do it against a really bad offense. Um, but if you need pivots, there's plenty of other guys, certainly. And you can play Seattle definitely against Jake Irvin. Lefties mostly, I think. Um, but righties are, are absolutely in play, too. He just pitches too, too much contact. Yankees stacks in play, more so on the late slate, but in play a little bit on the, on the main slate due to their pricing. Both arms in play. My favorite, if I had to choose between the two, would be Blackburn. But price adjusted, Johnny Brito is in play as well. Um, have questions mostly with about depth with Johnny Brito here, but he's a playable 6,400. He is one of those pivots in the 6K range off of Brian Wu if you need it. So that's it. We're done here. Keep an eye out for projections uploads um, all throughout the day. Sorry we went so long, but we got 15 games. So good luck to everybody if you are punting on this huge Tuesday slate.